This morning, we are finishing up our Advent and Christmas sermon series called Unexpected Journey. Um, next Sunday, we will start a new series, a, a visioning series um, called Catch the Vision, I think is what it's called, or something like that. Um, but today, as we heard the story of the shepherds, the continuation of the Christmas story, um, I would also then like to share with you the, the next part of the story from Luke, the, the part where Jesus is taken to the temple and presented and then given his name. A man named Simeon was in Jerusalem. He was a righteous, he was righteous and devout. He eagerly anticipated the restoration of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. The Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Led by the Spirit, he went into the temple area. Meanwhile, Jesus' parents brought the child to the temple so that they could do what was customary under the law. Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God. He said, now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, <clears throat> because my eyes have seen your salvation. You prepared this salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people, Israel. <clears throat> His father and mother were amazed by what was said about him, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this boy is assigned to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that generates opposition so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your innermost being too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, who belonged to the tribe of Asher. She was very old. After she married, she lived with her husband for seven years. She was now an 84-year-old widow. She never left the temple area, but worshiped God with fasting and prayer, night and day. She approached at that very moment and began to praise God and to speak about Jesus to everyone who was looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Mary and Joseph had completed everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to their hometown, Nazareth, in Galilee. The child grew up and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. May God add wisdom to the reading, hearing, and understanding of these words. <coughs> when I worked for the city of Mesa many, many years ago, we had a photocopier that was a pain in the neck. The copies hardly ever came out the way we wanted them to. It was constantly breaking down, and at least twice a month, we had to have the darn thing serviced. And every time the repairman came out, I asked him, are we doing something wrong? Why does this thing keep breaking down? And more often than not, the repairman would just shrug his shoulders and mumble something unintelligible while his head and his hands were deep in the recesses of that machine. Finally, I'd had enough of the constant complaints from my staff. And I told them, because we didn't have any money in order to replace the machine, I said to them, whenever you use this machine, expect that it will mess up. Because when it does mess up, then you won't be disappointed. And when it doesn't mess up, you can think of it as a gift. Now, for years, that philosophy worked for me. Every time I went up to the machine to make a copy, I would say to myself, it's going to mess up. And when it didn't, I had a little party inside my head. <laughs> Instead of expecting the machine to work, I expected the unexpected. I expected it to fail. And that way, I wasn't disappointed when it did. 
The story of Jesus' birth from beginning to end was a series of unexpected events. Mary didn't expect to be told by an angel that she would give birth to God's son. Nor did Joseph expect to be the earthly father of God's son. And Elizabeth, an old woman, didn't expect to become pregnant. And Mary and Joseph didn't expect to have to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem in the last days of her pregnancy. They certainly didn't expect the family guest room to be full when they arrived in Bethlehem and that the stable would be the only place where they would be able to spend the night. And even though they probably expected that Mary would give birth in Bethlehem, given the fact that she rode on that donkey for five to ten days, while, the, as the older versions of Scripture so eloquently put it, she was indeed great with child, we can assume that they did not expect her to give birth in a dirty stable with smelly animals looking on and that the only place she had to lay her child was in a manger, a feeding trough that was probably made of stone and full of slobbery hay. Not exactly the most desirable place where you want to lay your newborn. And yet, in spite of their expectations, all these unexpected events occurred. And in fact, there were more unexpected events yet to come. How long would they have to expect the unexpected? Well, according to the scriptures, not long. Because that very night, the shepherds out in the fields were visited by angels who brought good news of great joy. Now, this time it was the shepherd's turn uh, to experience the unexpected, and boy, was it ever unexpected. Suddenly, an angel appears to them, and naturally, they are terrified. I would be, too. And after the angel drops a bombshell, uh, I mean the good news, just as suddenly an entire company of angels show up and they all cry out together, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom God favors. Now after the angels leave, the shepherds head into town where they find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in that manger. But let's talk about the shepherds a moment, shall we? Because they weren't the kind of people that were expected to be invited, the first ones to be invited to see the Messiah, to see God's Messiah. You see, at one point in time, shepherds were held in high esteem. They had an important job to do, and they were expected to do it well. In fact, we read in the Old Testament that David was a shepherd before he was anointed to be Israel's king. But at some point in time, the, the roles reversed. Things changed, and the shepherds were no longer among the upper class. And in fact, by the first century, they were considered the lowest of the low. They were typically uneducated and usually very poor. And because more often than, than not, they lived outside with their animals, they smelled like dirty sheep. They seldom owned land, which meant they let their sheep graze on other people's land, which I'm sure didn't go over very well with them. So when Luke writes that the shepherds were the first invited by God to see Jesus, his first century hearers would not have been endeared like we are when we see the shepherds in the children's pageant on, on, on Christmas Eve. Instead, his hearers would have been shocked because they were the, the least expected to be the first ones to see Jesus. And imagine Mary's surprise when a group of dirty, smelly shepherds come to visit God's son in a cave. Now, if you've ever given birth, you know the last thing you want is visitors, especially the day of, right? 
But often that's when our visitors want to come, right? We are fascinated by these newborn babies. So as new mothers, we tolerate our visitors, right? We smile and we nod and we coo at the baby. You know, that's the way I imagine Mary when the shepherds arrive with their sheep. All she really wanted was a bath and a nap. But as a good Jewish woman and a good mother, she welcomed the shepherds, stink and all. We don't know how long they stayed, but when they left, they shared the good news with all around them, far and wide about this wonderful thing they had seen, the hope of Israel, the babe lying in a manger. And as unexpected as their visit was, after all, they didn't send a text message letting the family know they were on their way, Mary committed all of that to memory, and she pondered it all in her heart. Next, Luke tells us of an expected event one steeped in Jewish tradition, but with an unexpected twist. Now, in accordance to Jewish law, on the eighth day after a baby's birth, the young baby, the boy, uh, is presented at the temple for Brit Milah, which is the ceremony that is held during which the boy is circumcised and he is officially given his name. Well, in this case, while Jesus and his family were there at the temple, that's when the unexpected twist occurred. Simeon, described as a righteous and devout man, is drawn by the Spirit to the place in the temple where Jesus was. And when he sees that baby, when Simeon takes that child in his arms, he praises God and then goes on to say, Oh, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your will because my eyes have seen your salvation. He knew that Jesus was the one they were waiting for. He knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. He knew that Jesus was the anointed one, sent to save God's people. And then after that, when Anna, an elderly prophetess, also joined them in the temple, she knew that Jesus was the Messiah as well. And in fact, she, she joined them and she, she praised God along with Simeon. These elderly saints didn't expect to see the Messiah. Their encounter was another unexpected blessing, one of many that had been and were yet to come. Alice James whose only claim to fame was as the sister of novelist Henry James and the sister of philosopher William James, once wrote in her diary, truly nothing is to be expected but the unexpected. Sometimes I think we get too caught up in our own expectations of the world. We expect people to behave in certain ways. And when they don't meet our expectations, we're disappointed or even angry. And sometimes we set our own expectations of ourselves so high that when we fail, <clears throat> excuse me, when we fail to meet those expectations, expectations that are higher than is humanly possible to meet, we get frustrated when we fall short of that mark of perfection. But when we expect the unexpected, we are less likely to be disappointed. Kind of like with my photocopier, right? We are less likely to get angry when we miss that mark of perfection. We are less likely to get frustrated or depressed when bad things happen. We're more likely to trust that God will be present in the unexpected. And because God is present, even if the outcome is unexpected, ultimately we know that everything will be okay. One of my first jobs after graduating from college was at a, a firm in a small business in Southern California. 
And on my first day on the job, uh, I met with the president of the company who told me in no uncertain terms I was not to go anywhere near his desk. I was not to clean it. I was not to move the papers. I was not to do anything with his desk. Even though it was a holy mess, I was not to touch it. And he said to me, is that clear? Well, <laughs> of course. What was I going to say? I was young. I needed the job, and so I said, okay. Now, the rest of the employees that worked in this firm, they had worked together for quite some time. And so I was kind of the outsider of the group. Um, I was the, like the new kid on the block. So I kept, pretty much kept to myself. I did my job. I answered the phones and I typed reports. And I did whatever the president of the company wanted me to do and also what his rather high-strung vice president asked me to do. And you know, for a while, everything seemed to be going very well. Then several months after I started working there, one of the analysts became quite ill and she had to go on a medical leave. Rumor had it that she had had a nervous breakdown due to stress on the job. We were all quite concerned for her well-being. Then a few weeks later, about 30 minutes before quitting time, the vice president called me into her office. She handed me an envelope, which I found out later had my final check in it. She told me to go back and pack up my things, that I was being let go, uh, which is the polite way of saying, you're fired. Well. When I asked her why, I was stunned by, my res by her response. She said to me, you're not doing your job. You don't clean the boss's desk. When I told her that he had made it quite clear that I was not to come within three feet of his desk, she hemmed and hawed, and, and then the, the HR light bulb in her head went on. She remembered I was still on probation, which meant that I could be fired for any reason or no reason at all. So I went to my cubicle and I packed up my things and I went home, quite dejected. Later on, I found out that they had given my job to the analyst who had been on medical leave because she couldn't handle the job that she had previously been in. But the unexpected blessing was that in less than a week, not only did I have several job offers in hand, but they were for better jobs, with better companies, with better pay, and better benefits. Maybe I should have expected the unexpected. It would have saved me a lot of anguish and a lot of tears. From a spiritual perspective, when we expect the unexpected, it's likely that we will see God at work in the process. We will experience God's presence, and we will hear God's voice. And since we'll be listening, because we're expecting to hear God speak to us, we'll know more about what God wants for us. We will feel God's spirit. We'll be open to God's will. And we won't be surprised when the unexpected occurs because we'll be expecting the unexpected, which is another way of saying we will have faith in what God has in store for us. Now, to be clear, when we expect the unexpected, it's not our expectations that we're expecting, right? It's God's expectations. And we all know that God's expectations are very different from ours. When we expect the unexpected, we're not saying that things should happen according to our own desires. Instead, when the unexpected happens, we should recognize God's hand is at work. We will see that even when things aren't going our way, God is at work making a better way, creating a better outcome for us. Does that make sense? Well, if by chance it doesn't, maybe this video will help. Los Angeles, California. On a rain-slick freeway, tragedy shuts down four lanes of traffic. 
the semi truck has toppled over. It's a nightmarish accident, and it gets worse. We're told that there's a small car that's pinned underneath. Witnesses tell police that the driver is still inside the crushed car. The situation looks grim. These rescuers can't even see what it is that they're trying to uncover. The possibility of anyone surviving underneath tons of steel seems unthinkable. I do have medical 1040 heading that way. But even if the odds are a million to one, emergency crews have to try. Fire and rescue teams working at a breakneck pace. Forming a human conveyor belt, rescuers try to remove as much weight as possible. Next, they attach ropes to the sides. But lifting a truck like this requires heavy machinery. As the crane slowly heaves the trailer up, police and rescuers prepare for the worst. This is extremely dangerous. Finally, they lift away the truck. It looks like he is. He's moving. It's the driver, still breathing. Rescuers quickly use the jaws of life to pry open the mangled door. He's getting out. I don't believe it. Amazingly, the driver steps out and walks away from the wreckage. Expect the unexpected. Amen. Oh,